The pursuit of teenage hearts and minds was a full-time commitment at the Big Eight, from radio and TV to community events, record store appearances, and live concerts. But on a humid July evening in 1967 at Detroit's Fox Theater, CKLW's Swing and Time Review was suddenly forced to stop the music. The Parliaments and the Dramatics had already performed, and headliners Martha and the Vandellas were on stage when someone beckoned to Martha. I danced over to the edge while the music was yet playing, and someone said to me, there's a riot. A riot has broken out. You've got to tell everybody that to go home. You've got to tell them to walk calmly out of the theater because there's a curfew, and they've got to be home by 9 o'clock. And as you left, ooh, the smoke and the fire, it was burning everywhere, every a neighborhood. The trouble began a mile away from the theater, early that morning with a police raid on an illegal after-hours bar in the heart of the black community on 12th Street at Claremont. A crowd gathered, rocks were thrown, and the trouble spread. Looting, burning, and sniper fire wreaked havoc in the streets and fear and confusion in the suburbs. The border between Canada and the U.S. was closed briefly for the first time since 1838. The only ones who ventured across the bridge were volunteers from the Windsor Fire Department and a handful of reporters. Interestingly, there were three Canadian reporters over. Dick Smythe, Bert Allen, who was one of our technicians, and myself from the CBC. That was it. So Dick and I were the only journalists over there from a Canadian perspective. The Canadian perspective was unique. By day two of the riots, the United States government called in the National Guard to take control of the city. Under martial law, few reporters dared ask critical questions, except for Dick Smythe. There is a very unsavory aspect to the riots in Detroit, the detention of hundreds of prisoners under inhumane conditions. There are five busloads of prisoners parked in 80-degree heat in DSR buses outside the recorder's court building. One man told me before he was cut off by a soldier that he has had one sandwich and no water since 10 last night and was forced to urinate at the door of the bus. This is uh, one of the few storefronts on uh, Grand River that isn't smashed in. We've got Soul Brother written on the window. Uh, do you think this is the reason that it wasn't ransacked? Well, now across the street has Soul Brother, too, and they got them, so it's just one of those things. I still have a vivid memory of driving down that about about you know midnight or one o'clock in the morning, literally in flames and broken gas lines, and it was just like some of the stuff you see coming out of Baghdad, and then crossing the tunnel and sort of re-entering a world of sanity. I was at the switchboard. We watched the city burn, and um, it was something to see just to look out and see all the smoke. It was pretty bad, yeah. $50 million of damage, 1,680 fires, 7,000 people arrested and detained, 700 injuries, and 43 dead. It was the worst case of urban violence and guerrilla warfare in 20th century American history. It's a hard 